updated the mission list. We've received some new job offers. The details are on your iDroid. We finished decoding the informant's report. That floating kid we've run into a few times now. Looks like he was a test subject in clinical experiments. The Soviets called him the third boy. The third boy was brought to a lab on the outskirts of Moscow from Czechoslovakia, after which he was due to be sent to a research center in Leningrad, then Siberia, and finally an academic town in Novosibirsk. It doesn't appear that the researchers witnessed the talents we've seen from him, but nevertheless, he was quite the popular subject. His latent cognitive abilities suddenly awoke en route to Moscow. According to the report, the third boy was easily influenced by other individuals' biofields. Evil thoughts, in particular. They affected his mind like a virus. Extreme anger or resentment, motives for revenge, in other words. Now, during the transport flight to Moscow, the boy was exposed to a powerful mental energy field coming from a certain individual. Now, there should be a Kikongo English interpreter somewhere in that area. If you extract him, he could be plenty useful for us. What's unique about him is the way his acute telepathic abilities get taken over by another person's will. The boy began to physically parasitize individuals experiencing extreme anger and codify the host's desires. This includes amplifying the host's natural strengths. Or, in accordance with the host's desires, he can also implant program code in another individual, making them a puppet, essentially. Human neural synapses transmit weak electrical Currents, though at a level difficult to observe, warp the magnetic field outside the body. You gotta extract him. Able to pick up these weak fluctuations. Contrary to psychotronics, which involves controlling the human mind, his abilities as a receptor are too high. The emotions he picks up from another individual are amplified and unleashed into his body as they recur in his brain. They turn his subject on board. Leave the rest to us triggering paranormal phenomena like the spontaneous combustion of organic matter or psychokinesis, you know, moving an object without touching it. There's one other thing. While he's parasitizing a host, the voice... He's coming too. Roger that. ...allowing the will of the host to take control of his powers, like some annoying static drowning out your own voice. That means he isn't responsible for what's been happening. Somebody's extreme anger has manifested through the third boy's powers in ways none of us could have predicted. Which would mean this was going on somewhere around us. Looking back on it, a lot of things make sense now. The man on fire, Sahalanthropus, they both came to life thanks to the third boy's powers. Everything has been happening through him as a catalyst. We first saw him in the hospital on Cyprus. That's the target. The man on fire's desire for revenge gave him his new abilities in return. He next appeared at the Hamid Fighters Fort, where the honeybee was hidden. There, the boy parasitized Skullface's vengeful mind. He controlled Sahalanthropus, making it do whatever Skullface wanted. Same goes for when we extracted Emmerich onto the chopper. He appeared at the Devil's House in Central Africa. Skullface is will. Okay, subject is in. Via the third boy's powers. Everything is clear up to this point. But even the informant couldn't pinpoint who the host was in the cave within Serac power plant. Solanthropus suddenly became active, then crushed not only the man on fire, but Skullface as well. Surely neither of them could have been the host. Who else was at that location and you gotta extract him? than either of them. Whose will was controlling Sahalanthropus? According to the report, emotions transmitted in children's brains affect the surrounding magnetic field more strongly. Cerebral nerves are covered with insulation called myelin sheaths to increase impulse speed. 
The reason for this leakage has to do with the fact that children's myelin sheets are still developing. So, how many children do you remember being there? Children with a burning desire for revenge and bearing a grudge against you. I can think of only one. Eli. We don't know what kind of life he's... Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Nothing short of extraordinary. The third boy resonated with Eli's mind. And that means Eli bore the strongest animosity of all individuals within the boy's reception range, estimated to be a three-mile radius, beating out even Vulgan and Skullface. The third boy has probably remained hooked on Eli's anger since. You remember at the Devil's House, the third boy showed an interest in Shabani? That must have been his ego making a rare appearance. He may possess abilities far beyond anyone else in the world, but he's still a kid. Maybe them both being kids was enough to bring them together. And if so, maybe with Eli, he isn't feeding off him, but acting in symbiosis with him. Extraction arrived at so what kick-started the third boy's powers? If we look at the location and time that his plane went down, we can make a pretty good guess. When the plane experienced the first anomaly, it gave an accurate report of its position to a control tower, due north of the Black Sea, 125 miles east of Kiev. Dead south on the Black Sea is Cyprus's Green Line. So the plane's position was directly north of the hospital where you'd been asleep for nine years. And this anomaly was reported at exactly the same time that you woke up. The plane was enveloped in flame from the inside out. The fuselage burnt to ashes. There were no survivors, at least not publicly admitted. Your thoughts formed a synchronicity with the boy's psyche and were amplified inside his brain. That would have been more than enough to trigger his abilities. Your rage was like a big bang in his head, blowing the lid off his powers. The boy was then secretly moved to the lab outside of Moscow where Volgan was comatose. There, Volgan's thoughts resonated with the boy and he was awakened. Volgan became the man on Please fire, hell-bent on getting point. revenge on you. His instincts led him straight to you. Skullface knew Volgan from Operation Snake Eater, or perhaps from even before. Monitoring this pair of extraordinaries, he discovered the hospital and sent his assassin and XOF. Skullface was probably watching the situation from close by. Then, realizing how useful these two test subjects could be, he approached them. Reacting to Skullface's thirst for revenge, this time the boy let Skullface's will control Volgan. Volgan, at times driven by personal revenge, at times through Skullface's will, kept on moving, though his body was little more than dead meat. Perhaps there were moments where even your thoughts affected him as well. But without the boy's power, it was like the plug had been pulled from the socket. Everything was powered by anger, malice, revenge. This is how the end of the report sums things up. Both the third boy and the man on fire were originally test subjects of paranormal research for military applications. Like telekinetically controlling the leader of an enemy nation and making him launch a nuke. Or stopping the heart of someone on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. Experimenting with latent human abilities. They were used as tools of the Cold War. The boy's only crime was being born with unique gifts. But he was sacrificed on the altar of war. His life reduced to slavery under other people's wills. Turned into a living weapon with no will of his own. And eventually the only emotion he could feel must have been the desire to get revenge for the hand he'd been dealt. Boss, it's you that awakened the boy's powers. But there's more to it than that. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to.
12 hours after exposure to the blood of a symptomatic colleague, I found myself making my way up the stairs to this room. And I am not alone. Everyone who's infected, we've all come up here wanting to get outside. I know full well I mustn't leave, given the possibility I'm infected. Yet, I can't contain this urge I feel inside me, like the alcoholic who tries to make any excuse for one more drink. Every step I took up those stairs filled me with this sense of bliss. I still have all my wits about me. It took no time at all to rewire the electronic lock and open the emergency exit. Then, just as I was about to set foot outside, I finally realized what was going on. This desire for freedom is not my own, but that of the vocal cord parasites inside me. They want the raven to feed on us, pecking us to death, attracted by these sweet secretions. They have mutated to facilitate this. The sweet smell is powerful. He's coming too. Roger that. Even a species with such a weak nose. So, before the parasites take complete control... You're gonna extract him. I must. Most of the staff in here are already infected. At least, everyone I've looked at is. Infection with his parasites causes a high fever in the family. I have modified a pair of night vision goggles to react only to the temperature range. With these goggles, you can identify who is infected. Other infected will, like me, feel compelled to make it outside. If the ravens get their meal, they'll head for land next. That cannot be allowed to happen. Cypher was having the PF's transport. Before we met you, the boss recovered it from a truck crossing the savannah. Are there metallic archaea inside it? Yes, the archaea metabolize uranium-235 to subsist. They must be stored inside yellow cake, or they cannot survive. So those biological traces we took for impurities were actually the real cargo. Of course, they are deactivated so they do not trigger a sudden enrichment. They are like baker's yeast. Yet, they do gradually enrich the uranium as they feed. I imagine you detected weapons-grade traces. Yeah, we did. And the malachite that was loaded on the truck had traces of uranium in it, too. So that's the flower, huh? Skullface was gonna sell do-it-yourself new kits. The uranium enriching Archaea complete with the user's manual. And the ores with the uranium could be sourced by the client or provided by Cypher. Even the trace amounts buried in common ores can be enriched to weapons grade uranium by the metallic Archaea. Proving that must have been the most important factor of the trials. That and the ability to successfully prevent detonation. So if the amounts of uranium in the ores are low enough, they can get past any inspection. And you only need a tiny amount of the Archaea to act as the yeast. No great challenge to smuggle that either. The first step towards saturating the world with nukes. His plan. That was not my intention. <laughs> my only goal in developing the metallic Archaea was to save the Diné. What made you think a tool for creating undetectable new-
Extraction arrived at Mother Base. Please select a heading to Afghanistan. Activate Sahelanthropus in Afghanistan. This is how Skullface wanted things to play out. The Soviet Union secretly develops a new type of nuclear weapon and successfully deploys it in Afghanistan. Revealing the existence of Sahelanthropus results in a return to the glory days of the Cold War. The threat it poses reignites the nuclear arms race between the world's major powers. The demand for nuclear weapons increases around the globe. What if you then introduced a nuclear weapon anyone could get their hands on? Non-nuclear nations, militant groups of all shapes and sizes, they'd all jump at the chance. Soholanthropus was a marketing tool to sell nukes all around the world. But I think it's safe to say that plan was stamped out before it got up and running. The world's intelligence agencies never did turn up anything conclusive on it. After all, Sahelanthropus vanished before word could spread. Everything that's happened is already a fading memory, never to join the pages of history. Except for Cypher. Cypher won't forget. They'll already be working on something quietly beneath the surface. They'll use the pieces of data scraped together from this incident to build their own bipedal weapon. It'll take them a long time to complete it, but for now, the greed sector have found their new life's work. We'll have to be ready, too. Side ops list updated. Please select a landing zone heading to Central Africa. Transylvania after it reverted to Hungary from Romania. 
While he was young, the country allied with Germany as part of the Axis powers, but later during the war, they came under Soviet occupation. The Hungarians struggled for independence, but the Soviets came down hard. Just like he said, time and again, the country was ruled by a foreign tongue. When he was a young boy, he lost his native language, the bedrock for any developing child. His country, his family, his face, his identity, everything was stolen from him. All he had left was his skull. Skullface first tried his hand at espionage during all the chaos. That's the target. Agents, military officials, and soldiers who operated out of Hungary during the war vanished over the course of several months. This Soviet spy hunt rocked the counter-intel world. Mysterious fatal illnesses, accidental deaths, drownings, people having strokes behind closed doors. Just like Stalin, no one knew who was behind it. But all you need to do was look the motive. They were all taken out by a man without a face. And now we've got an idea of how he did it too. He got really You gotta extract him. But he wasn't finished. Skullface defected to the West, eventually ended up with the SAS. That's where he met Zero. It's possible he began planning this whole thing back then. It's hard to say. In any case, he's coming too. Roger that. He always did have a thing for oddballs. But this one was set to lead a unit no one else would know about. When Zero created Fox. He also formed XOF as a support team. You got, him, you got a minute? It's about the quarantine facility. We more or less figured out what caused the mutation in the vocal cord parasites. It was the radiation from that scanner. And the one who installed it was Emmerich. I've added a tape recording of the interrogation. You should listen to it. Pulled the trigger. Just like Newton's third law. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, sometimes as a mole or a scout, sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail. Making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. We only have his word to go on, but Skullface's goal was revenge against those who'd use language. Mission list updated. Please select a heading to Afghanistan. Deploying. children repair Sohalanthropus. I just answered their questions. I had no idea they would actually try to fix it. I mean, can you imagine a child piloting it? Oh, sure. It wouldn't work. Well, I bet it's just like riding a bike. I Please said it didn't work. It... Who did you try? I, I didn't. Did you put your son in it? Oh, we never did that. His name was, uh, Hal, wasn't it? I, I thought you said you never saw his face. Analysis. But you made him pilot Sahalanthropus. You used him in your experiments. He wanted to get in. <sighs> it was such a short time we had. So he was with you. We were happy. 
You're still happy now. Changing your lies to suit the listener and getting by slipping through the cracks. Building layer upon layer of convenient stories until nothing means anything to you anymore. You're happy all the time because you don't even notice you're doing it. Think hard. Who are you really? You're not a victim and you're not the silent majority. You're a perpetrator and a petty hypocrite. The real world doesn't make you suffer. It's the other way around. Well, doctor, I have the report on the incident at the quarantine facility. Assuming the vocal cord parasite evolved, I'm sorry, underwent a mutation. The only plausible explanations are exposure to some high concentration mutagen or radiation. As you know, some of the staff at the quarantine facility were infected with the parasites. The Wolbachia prevented them from copulating, but the parasites themselves can't be removed from their host's vocal cords. Once you're infected with Skullface's parting gift, you're stuck with it. The researchers regularly used X-ray equipment to monitor the parasites in their throats. No problem there, they kept a close eye on the radiation doses. But that equipment didn't just give off X-rays. It was also emitting beta rays. Even though that's unnecessary for the scans. See, beta rays have... Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Meaning the only logical conclusion is that someone added in a beta ray emitter to trigger a mutation. He's Those coming too. Roger that. Because the emitter was retrofitted, the shielding was inadequate. And the person who ordered and inspected the equipment was you, Doctor. That makes you the only person with the opportunity to install that emitter. So now you're saying I sabotage medical equipment for some wild plan to make the vocal cord parasite kill everyone? Or maybe you thought it'd reveal a way to treat the parasite without using the Wolbachia. With that much to barter, I suppose some people would welcome even a pathetic cur like you. Just stop it! You'd have no shortage of buyers, but most would be happy with just the parasite. You wouldn't need to offer anything else. However, if that buyer already knew about the parasite, they'd also know that by itself, it's no longer the... chip it once was. To sell to that buyer, you need to throw in a bonus. A way to one-up it. There's only one buyer who'd be after that. <laughs> Emmerich, we record all communications on Mother Base. That includes radio transmissions to and from homemade devices. You've been in frequent contact with people in America. A private biotech company. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. They are connected to Cypher. You made a deal with Cypher. You offered them a new parasite in exchange for your safety. This is the only place in the world where the vocal cord parasite still exists. And you used it as a testing ground. Tried to resurrect their bioweapon. You gotta extract him. The parasite has failed. Your bullshit ends now. And don't think you're leaving here alive. Analysis complete. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Out of here. All of you. Back to your posts. No, hang on. 
Huey has killed their comrades and interfered with their lives. They've had all they can take. You get to extract him. Being a nation unto yourselves. But, but from the outside, you're just thugs, rebels, a militia, you terrorists, an unhinged threat to... Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. A bunch of psychopaths! You are. So you're not with us? No! I, I didn't... I thought we were on the same side. That's too bad. I... I didn't mean... <laughs> Men, you will have justice. But our organization, the boss's organization, is built on order and reason. There will be no lynch mob. So stand down for today. We will gather all He's the... He's coming too. Roger that. Then he will be tried. Dismissed. <laughs> That should enable you to sneak past enemies. It'll be murder in the eyes of the world. You've lost your minds. Don't you get it? You're seeing phantoms. Just look at that dog. No. You named him D-Dog, but it's obvious anyone could see that's a wolf. Because you're all a bunch of wild dogs. You wanted to believe he was too. To feel some connection to fight your loneliness. You wanted something to cling to, to prove you deserve to be alive. You wanted to forget the death, Please your sins. So you'd back. cling on to dogs, or, or wolves, or even Big Boss. The boss is the same, isn't he? Every one of you is alone. That's why you suspect your own. Area of operations. I know. Because I do the same. I'm one of you too. Alone. Open your eyes! What you're doing is murder! Plain and simple. All you ever create is war! War and violence can never lead to peace! The one that covers. The parasite that lives on the surface of the skull's bodies is what gives them their power. Similar to my children who live in my skin. I modify the parasites I isolated from the body of that old man, differentiating them with various abilities. One that can blend perfectly into its surroundings by exposing the pigments in its cells at will. Another that by harboring multiple species of metallic archaea can oxidize and reduce metal. Isolating the one that covers and transplanting it into an artificial should provide the same. You gotta extract him. The skulls. But they can only subsist within a human body. Once transplanted into the medium, they will eventually die. Another thing, the weakness of the one that covers is desiccation. Their surface moisture loss is subject on board. Leave the rest to us. They give up this is to alleviate this by releasing the salts inside them as microparticles. Water vapor condenses around them, appearing as mist. But this dries out the atmosphere until they cannot even produce mist. And once their supply of water from the host runs out, the parasites are in danger. They, along with their host, enter a form of suspended animation. However, a similar effect occurs if they come into contact with a large amount of water. Rain, for instance, the one that covers will temporarily abandon other processes in his eagerness to absorb the water. Pitiholone. Make the weather your ally.
Extraction arrived at Mother Base. Please select a land heading to Central Africa. Deploying. Remember the White Mamba? Of course, he's been going by Eli since we brought him on base. He was the leader of the child soldier unit we took out of that village and into our protection. Well, according to the kids you brought back here, all the escapees were especially close to Eli. There's reason to suspect he's behind all six escapes. We've already detained him. I'll be questioning him shortly. Wait, wait. You'll be? Ocelot. You're incapable of taking an impartial stance with those kids. Question them all you want, it'll get you nowhere. Ocelot, you get too many kicks from your art of interrogation. It's not a matter of art. It's about quick, minimal strokes of psychological warfare. That's what gets the answers. And it's the best way to keep both questioner and subject safe. The risks only increase the more an interrogation drags on. At that point, it causes as much pain to the inflictor as the inflicted. Like I said, too many kicks. What I'm trying to tell you is we need quick results. Otherwise, it'll be too little, too late. I know that. And besides, I know the subject. I won't go overboard with a kid. Forget it. You're not needed. Snake. Boss, come in. Boss? Boss, we've got the results of Eli's genetic tests. We can finally put this worry behind us. We used the PCR technique and conducted DNA fingerprinting of the copied DNA sequences. Neither is mainstream science yet. But the concepts and procedures are sound. Both tests say there is 0% chance that the two of you are blood relatives. Meaning the results are negative. He's not your son. Nor is he your clone. He's just another person. It was 12 years ago that Zero made plans to clone you. Eli's age and appearance certainly are a good fit. I admit the first time I saw him I did a double take. But it looks like we were worried for nothing. Eli isn't your clone. Though you might still have one somewhere out there. But if Eli isn't the boss's clone, why does he seem so obsessed with him? Not to mention having one hell of an attitude for his age. I don't know. Learning the truth about himself, cursing the fact he's a clone, bearing a grudge against selfish adults, and coming to hate who he was cloned from. Big boss. If that were really the case, I could understand it. I might even feel a bit sorry for him. <sighs> but no clone could have a totally different DNA fingerprint. And the test left no room for error. You yourself were there when we drew Eli's blood sample. Come to think of it, when we went to OKB Zero, he'd snuck onto a chopper and was there. Yeah. He was acting strange even then. Or actually from a little before that time. That was exactly when we began these tests. Maybe he suspected something when we drew the sample, not knowing what we were doing to him, and becoming mistrustful of us. Hard to say. Eli's had an attitude problem from day one. So what is he then? Well, if he's gonna tell us that himself, we'll need to get him to open up more first. The whole 
idea of the vocal cord parasites was that they'd only copulate once exposed to a specific language over time. That the parasites infecting our men in the laboratory laid their eggs straight away. The larvae were eating their lung tissue almost immediately. What kind of mutation was it? Those who were infected and cured still carried the vocal cord parasites in their throats. They were still there. But the males had been rendered female by the Volbachia. Then copulation could not occur. So we thought. But it is the Volbachia that mutated. Not the parasites? You remember I told you the Volbachia attempts to maximize its number of female infected hosts? Yes, hence the male to female transformation. Precisely. But other Volbachia strains use different methods. Cytoplasmic incompatibility, killing the males, and parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis? Aphids. Aphids use that to reproduce via females only. Very good. The females lay their eggs without a male present, creating clones of themselves in explosive numbers. Parthenogenesis was originally a means for an organism to take maximum advantage of abundant resources by increasing its numbers. Certain strains of Obakia forced this to occur, to create more and more infected females. And that's why our men develop symptoms in the blink of an eye. Wolbachia causing parthenogenesis is common in parasitic wasps. Of course, the Volbachia I introduced to your men did not have this characteristic. But I believe the mutation, Analysis whatever it was, caused it to force parthenogenesis in its host, the vocal cord parasites. The Volbachia we used to prevent egg laying became the agent of limitless reproduction.